All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, so I appreciate that intro. And I realized listening to the previous talk, um, that was up here. That's talking about LLM. I'm actually going to um, go down a level. I'm going to be, I'm a plumber. Um, I put things together. So I'm here today um, because generative AI is super hot right now, um, as Hansel would say. Oops, let me get that down. Um, and it's an opportunity um, for my community, Kubernetes, um, to help airflow. So again, plumbing, lower level, it's about running AI. And there was a lot of services used there. And it was, I was reflecting on that as we were talking in, in the previous talk is, there's so many different levels in computing today, all the way from the bottom of the stack to the top. And so what I wanna focus on is what are the patterns that sit underneath that may not be the things that you would use directly, but they influence and they empower the things that you talk about. And infrastructure can still be exciting, although it's a lot less exciting than it was 10 years ago. Um, 10 years ago, we were talking about containers and cloud. Uh, but what I see today with generative AI, with uh, ML in general, is the potential is much broader. And 10 years ago, we had you know, our share of skeptics um, about you know, our containers or cloud, really these things that we're gonna go use. And I think the answer to that was pretty obvious to the folks who were working on it because it made their lives easier. Um, but that transition also gave us that excitement, gave us an opportunity not just to do the basic stuff, right? To move to containers or serverless or the cloud, um, but it was about process. It was about making people more efficient. Um, and that's hard to do. You know, we build things and then we, we build the next thing. And all that old stuff builds up. Somebody's got to maintain that and make that better. So uh, the transition to cloud gave us ubiquitous observability. It gave us continuous integration and deployment. And I feel old now saying that because there's a lot of people now who like, they take that for granted. But we had to build that. All of us have to build the next thing. And we're doing that right now for LLM. And it's easy to be cynical about you know, what it is that uh, generative AI is. Oh, this is a gold rush. Let's just go sell picks and shovels. Um, but I think it's much more useful to be optimistic in this perspective. Um, what can we use excitement to accomplish um, more than just you know, funny uh, chat transcripts from passive aggressive AI bots? And the previous keynote showed you something that was very practically useful. I think we're just starting um, to touch on the potential of what uh, large models are gonna show us. So I, I, tend to, I tend to always take the positive side here is that um, why be cynical when it's so much more fun to be an optimist? And uh, Airflow powers a broad swath of the world's data engineering. Um, Kubernetes runs much of the world's production ML. What can we do together? So to speed up the part where I explain why you should care about what I should think, I appreciate the intro. Um, I don't usually uh, like to talk about myself. Um, so what I've done is I've put it in a chat transcript and we're gonna talk about it in the third, talk about myself in the third person, which uh, feels weird and, and uh, novel. So um, I helped build Kubernetes and that's true. Um, but, in the beginning, you don't always know what you're building. You don't understand the problem. You're searching for product market fit, and sometimes you do things. And so what I like to say is, if you hate something about Kubernetes, it's my fault. If you like it or you don't think about it, somebody else implemented it. Because a lot of the really hard decisions, you don't get right the first time. But later on, we get a chance to think about it the second time. So um, I talked about, you know, I worked at Kubernetes, I worked on um, OpenShift at Red Hat, which was about taking Kubernetes to the enterprise. And in my head, the thing that is really important is standardizing what we all do. I think it's much better if we're all using the same flawed approach to running software than if we all invent individually a bunch of flawed mechanisms for running software, right? None of us are perfect. And that pattern I saw, and I still see, um, is that when all of us do the same bad things together, we fill up Stack Overflow. And so you can go find the answers to your questions about why is it not working. The more things are centralized, the more things are standard, the better chance we have of actually answering those questions. And now, when someone goes and scrapes Stack Overflow and puts it into a chat bot, we have the answers to the questions, which we wouldn't have if we were all doing something uh, bespoke and custom. Uh, and this maybe is a little scary, like that when I was putting stuff into a chat bot trying to get the outcome that I wanted. And uh, when I saw this, I was like, oh, AI safety actually really is really important. Um, 
but Kubernetes isn't going to become Skynet. Uh, if you don't help us, like if the Airflow community can't give Kubernetes something to go do, we'll probably just earnestly and unintentionally create something else that's going to frustrate you. So think about this as an opportunity. Um, we're all trying to do the best thing uh, for each other. And the goal of my keynote is to highlight those opportunities here and see if we can capture some of that excitement. So pop quiz, um, I'm gonna ask for audience participation. How many of you use Kubernetes and Airflow? Whether that's running on top of Kubernetes, okay. I was afraid that I was talking to a whole bunch of people who had no idea what Kubernetes was. So I'm sorry, I apologize. Please don't all come find me afterwards. Um, most of those things that I regret, like I did them with the best intention. So, uh, so I'll summarize Kubernetes really quick since you all know Kubernetes. Uh, Kubernetes started off as a way to run containers on multiple machines when Docker only ran on one. This was a huge change, blew our minds. It was so much better than VMs. I hate VMs. I never want to work with VMs again. Um, and I somehow found a job where I only work with VMs. Uh, the first real use case at the time was scaling up digital natives and a few, not many, but a few motivated enterprise teams who were growing. You know, 2014, 2015, 2016, Web 2.0 was big. Cloud was going to be this thing. Uh, it was there, people were using it, but it hadn't yet hurt, hit the early majority. And the workload was services or microservices, web front ends, API back ends, lots of programming languages. But unlike previous popular orchestrators, Kubernetes tried something new. We recognized that every workload has some state somewhere in a database, attached file system, it's part of the output of a job. Uh, many of these workloads look just like web apps. Um, they just wanted a specific directory to persist when the container got restarted. Why? Um, and, and I think the, the lesson I took from this was, why be the best at one thing when you can be mediocre at multiple things? And it sounds funny, but I, I like to think that that's Kubernetes superpower, which is we run all of the things better than you running it individually yourself. But we give you the room, for instance, by adding batch capabilities that we're not the best at, or by working with a whole bunch of great ecosystem components on top, like Airflow. Round of applause for Airflow, please. <laughs> we want to be something that people can run on top of. And I like to say, um, if you want to get a correct, if you want to get a correct answer from the internet, you have to pose an incorrect answer and everyone will correct you. And so one of the things that Kubernetes did was we created this space where everyone could go correct us at how bad we were at running stateless applications or stateful uh, applications or batch. And the specialists go and do that better than us. And that's success to me. So um, Kubernetes was successful um, for startups and for enterprises. Uh, enterprises really enjoyed the chance to get off of their bespoke workload platforms that they were writing and maintaining themselves and use and get to blame somebody else for all of the problems. And that's good. That's progress. Um, we all work together uh, to make something that's better than individually we can all achieve. And Kubernetes was a safe bet. Uh, and safe is relative, you know, so I'll, I'll take, uh, I'll continue to take the slings and arrows here. Um, Kubernetes isn't perfect. And the more complex you put all this stuff together, uh, eventually things go wrong. And so there's lots of good reasons not to run everything in Kubernetes, to trust managed services for individual parts of your application, and that's okay. But a lot of those managed services, in turn, use Kubernetes to run their applications. So uh, this is basically, uh, you know, and, and once we have outages, we need observability and security, and you can standardize that. There's that word again. And then, you know, now we're kind of in a spot where there's lots of people out there who have lots of uh, clusters, but it's not really standardized. And so for the last 10 years, this kind of been this process of just trying to glom the, the ball of mud um, together so that everybody can get that standardization and then build on top. And, you know, we like to build our stack of turtles um, all the way high, and that's progress. <clears throat> so uh, we don't have to be the best. We just want to be better than everybody writing it themselves. And we give you that flexibility and control. Um, and accidental complexity is dangerous. So when you have a lot of essential complexity, running all these different workloads, modern applications, web services, state, databases, um, you need some rules to manage that danger, like if you're a diver. 
So we have to think carefully about what we add next. We try not to um, regress things. As we became a mature community, it became, we became more and more conservative, and we still make mistakes because ultimately you need to add things to keep people happy. If you stop making people happy, they go away. And so we try to generalize problems, and at the end of the day, we like to give you that escape hatch. It's your problem now. Um, and that's the, the good old Spider-Man quote, uh, with great power comes great responsibility. There's always a balance. And you need to make that, you need to make that decision on your own. Um, and we're so low down on the stack. You know, just, I was kind of having that moment in the first keynote. I was like, I'm at the bottom looking up. And it feels like looking up at a boat and being like, I wonder if they're having a good time on that boat. So I'm here today to ask you, are you having a good time on the boat? And... What can we do going forward to make your lives easier? Um, we get to see some patterns sitting down at the bottom, which is the, the bulk of the talk today. Um, but it's about how generative AI is being run, some of the trends, and what we can specifically do to help make sure things work uh, for Airflow, as well as for Kubernetes users um, together. Because we, we need to go invest in some of those things going forward. So, Generative AI is big, huge, uh, staggeringly large. Uh, you could throw adjectives all day. And that's because it's the best approach we've found for solving a really hard problem is don't actually try to solve the problem, just throw more compute and data at it. And surprisingly, that actually turned out to work. It wasn't surprising to some people, but to the rest of us, we crossed that threshold sometime um, you know, in the fall of last year where everybody's like, oh. AI is here, but AI had already been here. And um, you know, a curve, this curve is about the amount of um, training uh, compute you need to train these big models, and it's a nice way faster than Moore's law. So it's not just normal. And that growth, um, Google, the company I work for, uh, we often call the public clouds hyperscalers because of that massive amount of infrastructure that the public clouds went and created over the last 20 years. Um, if you watch the keynotes or sessions at Google Clouds conference, which was three weeks ago, uh, which if you didn't, I'll tell you about them. I'm very happy to. Uh, everyone in this space is making investments to do the next level of hyperscale because this curve says there's value here. Everybody realizes it. And we don't just need more compute, we need staggeringly larger amounts of compute. So um, you know, examples like giant clusters of TPUs, um, which is Google's uh, accelerator that's even more specialized than GPUs, but works for generalized ML problems. Um, high bandwidth internet working for GPUs. Like Again, super low level problems, but these are the enablers for getting those foundation models you saw. Uh, Giant clusters uh, for GKE and for uh, Kubernetes, um, you know, you want to scale your jobs up, you want to run even more, pack it all in. All of that compute is starting to come online, and over the next few years, we'll keep coming online. And we're going to need more data, which I hope you, all of you are going to help with. And that data and the use cases, and as this compute starts to trickle in, what we see and what I anticipate is you're going to see these use cases start to move beyond what we were showing before, simple chat bot kind of things. As we have better tools, as we have more compute, people go and figure out new ways to use it. And that's the curve that I'm thinking about right now, which is there's a lot more compute coming. Let's say 100x. And that's going to come with a lot more data. Let's say 100x. What do we actually have to do to get ahead of that? So uh, the first assumption, and this is a safe one, is people are just going to keep using the stuff they're already using. We're already doing ML engineering. We're already doing data engineering. There might be a disruptive new framework uh, you know, that comes in and sweeps us all off our feet, but it'll take five or 10 years to roll out. The critical period for a lot of us is going to be in the next few years. As we see this, we want to get more data, and we want to get that data to compute. We need all that compute to go turn it into models. And we're going to integrate that with our existing models. And we're going to have more workloads and more people. How do we scale that? So to, to stay focused, um, I'm not worried about the LLM as a service giant foundation models. That's somebody else's problem. You'll access that as a service. Um, you know, OpenAI is doing a great job of that right now. Uh, Google's got BARD. There's a few others um, you know, coming online that 
these giant models all run as a service, that's front-end engineering now. And that's important, and it's going to have data engineering in it. But I'm focused on the next set of workloads down, which is all the other models. Um, and there'll be a huge set of those, those simple applications. That's the new serverless to me, is using prompt engineering. Uh, the deeper levels are what we're, what, uh, we're going to have to, to satisfy from the Kubernetes perspective. Um, we want to keep people focused on the interesting bits. Don't get into the details like I'm doing right now. And we want Kubernetes to get simpler. Um, look for places where we can trade old flexibility for new simplicity. And finally, um, MLOps is kind of fragmented when I look around. Uh, you have some early things like Kubeflow, which baked in some patterns that not everybody wants or everybody needs now. And as the needs change, you have a bunch of early adopters of ML who built their own platforms. Those platforms are starting to get older. And so they don't always adapt to what you need to do to bring accelerators in, for instance. And so Kubernetes role can help fit in those common elements that the next disruptive ML plop, MLOps platform should use. We want to look for things that everybody will need that can pragmatically use and make existing uh, work easier. And we're not an ML, MLOps platform or development platform. We're going to go to everybody else and ask them what they need. So there's a couple of phases, and, and Kubernetes focuses this lower level, orchestration, scheduling, getting access to data. Um, during experimentation, um, you know, you, you're validating new ideas, flexibility matters. Um, you have an inner loop in data science, which is about getting access to data and using it, and then putting it someplace and getting more data. Can we make that faster? Um, when you have teams that are starting to use accelerators, can we get you the accelerator faster and make sure that it looks like the accelerator, the GPU or the TPU or whatever else gets invented tomorrow? Can we make that faster for you as platform uh, teams when you expose this to your data scientists? Uh, training is the big, the big compute uh, driver. Scale times complexity equals cost. Um, but if you're not training trillion parameter models like those big guys, you hope, and I would hope as well, that the features that they're using to make those batch jobs more reliable and scale better trickle down to regular workloads. And while the innovation, I think, again, I'm a plumber, the innovation will happen with this group and with the folks above us. When you go to production, you expect it to be reliable. You need it to be consistent. And one of the things that we hear is that this is a really complex period for actually going to production with big ML, which is you have a whole bunch of choices. You have to make a bunch of hard trade-offs, and it's really expensive. So you're trying to bring these new capabilities on and thread a very narrow line. So how do we help you make those trade-offs? So I'm going to go through four areas, and I may not get to all of them um, because they're all pretty deep, but I'm going to highlight some areas where things we're doing in Kubernetes and thinking about that could help Airflow as a technology or the platform teams that run Airflow or potentially just help other workloads that are around data engineering and how those might be interesting. I'd love your feedback. If you can't find me here today, I have my email and uh, Slack and uh, Twitter handle at the end, and you can reach out to anybody in the community. Please do not hesitate to, to directly message me and say you're wrong, because that discussion matters at this critical time. So um, in the beginning, we had containers. And I, and I put the word uh, DAG up there. I would hope that everybody in this room knows what DAG means if you use Airflow, but it means directed acyclic graph, and it's the idea that you, you have a set of tasks. Kubernetes started with parallel containers, and over the years, um, we knew that you, know, you might have a bunch of containers running together with a bunch of operational problems, or you might just have two parts of your application. Um, but we also wanted to do some common initialization. We wanted to pull out getting secrets or loading data into where your container was going to run. And we, we tried to stay simple. We didn't want to overcomplicate it. And the problem was is that we overcomplicated in two directions. We tried to start simple. 
and we tried to be very conservative about what we added. We just recently, after 26 releases, took the first real feedback to this very simple model of a bunch of sequential containers that can go and share stuff on the file system, and then you run your real containers, and we added a sidecar which if some of you have run um, you know, Kubernetes, the sidecars are the things, the containers that run alongside that provide operational problems. But the problem before was when you ran these init containers, they would stop. And then you'd run your regular containers. But if you have a proxy that you want your regular containers to use, well then you want that to start before the regular containers run. So we had no way to solve this. And we added a construct which was a sidecar, which is it's an init container that keeps running. Cool, so now we have this really complex model that doesn't actually generalize the problem. What if we generalize the problem? Um, and so this is something that you know we've talked about for years. But what if, when you know you use Kubernetes and you could define a pod, you could do a DAG of containers, and it would be static? Would that be enough for Airflow? Would that be too much for Airflow? You'd get local container orchestration. It wouldn't try to you know we're not tr trying to step into the Airflow space or anything. We're not going to try to do that distributed across machines, but we'd give you a tool, a primitive that could um, potentially help you. So that that's idea 1. This is something we could we could work on if we had someone out there who said this would be awesome, we'd love to have it. Um, a second one is uh, you've got these shared resources a lot of times you got GPUs, they're really expensive, so you don't want to have too many of them. But then you have experiment, experimentation with notebooks, and they want to use the accelerators. And you have big training jobs that need all of the accelerators. Then you got your production workloads. And there's one easy way to do it, which you could split this all up and then just pay all the money. Or you can split it up and auto scale up and down. A pretty common problem in batch systems is that the way you solve this is actually with queuing. So you go and you say like, hey, when new jobs come in, we'll order them and we'll make sure you get all the resources you want. Kubernetes didn't have this, we were too simple. Uh, and recently, um, uh, a number of folks from Google actually, and a bunch of job systems exist above Kubernetes that each built their own mechanisms for this. And the best outcome would probably have been that we had something at the beginning that everybody could use, but we didn't because we were just trying to get stuff out there and find product market fit. And so recently, some folks from Google actually went and started a project that said, hey, can we actually go add this queuing so that everybody's operational problems get easier? So my question maybe to this community would be, is batch queuing something that's important? And this is maybe like down lower, but it's like, are you going to have lots of teams that all need the same resources that you need to share? Do your workflows run into each other? Are you implementing something like queuing in Airflow that we could potentially pull out. And so this is more a call for, you know, so much of this is uh, the right conversation at the right time, is uh, we're all trying to do our own things, and it's, there's nothing wrong with that. That's how humans scale, is we just go off and do all our own things. Um, and this is an opportunity to say, like, maybe this project, the Q project, um, is an opportunity for us to improve Airflow if batch queuing could actually help Airflow to be more efficient or help platform teams speak up, let us know. Um, and auto scaling actually becomes more important as well because again, you have these really expensive GPUs. When you stop using them, you'd love to stop paying for them. And uh, scheduling is even more complex. Um, I could go on for days about scheduling and I won't. Um, but scheduling for most of the last 10 years has been like, well, what's our job really in Kubernetes? It's to take a small workload and put it in a big machine, and then to find other workloads and put it on the same big machine so that when you pay for the big machine, you get your money's worth. And we're used to that. That's what Linux has been doing for 20 years. Um, so Linux is really good at div divvying up CPUs among processes. But generative AI is kind of upending this because we're not scheduling small jobs onto big machines and we're like, oh, this is such an easy problem. If only you would tell us how many resources you actually want to use. No, no, people are telling us how many generative AI resources they need, which is all of them. And they say like, I need a GPU. They don't ask for a part of a GPU. You can't really share GPUs well today. Um, new accelerators are coming online. And so the models that people are building are about the size of the GPU. Like I, I kind of follow along with the, um, the Llama community and the open uh, LLM um, space and everybody's trying to cram the biggest possible thing with the fewest number of hacks into the thing that they have, which is you know a consumer GPU or whatever they cobbled together in their home lab. 
And I see that in, in, in uh, platform teams as well. Everybody's trying to get this capacity that's just not there yet because this new use case is so darn big. So we can do more to help solve this problem. This is like a really early day problem, but I would call it the, we're about to go from a world where scheduling was super easy to where you're going to pay a lot of money unless you've got a pretty good scheduler. And we've got all these, you know, we did such a great job of bringing everybody in and it all runs together. And suddenly that's going to stop running all together. And everybody's going to be fighting for these GPUs. So one of the opportunities I think um, that this is not even really well solved is can we go and work with a whole bunch of, can we Kubernetes go work with a bunch of people in the ecosystem to say, hey, Airflow, Sometimes your teams are going to need GPUs for data engineering or for model training or for just basic analysis and test tasks. Sometimes another team is going to be using a different framework and is going to need those GPUs. How do we get everybody to share? So I call this the sharing problem. Um, and it's, you know, there's other problems too, like accelerators. Everybody's just like slamming stuff together and hacking. Uh, the hacks I've seen in the last year, it's, it's unbelievable. And it's awesome because people are actually going and building real value out there. Uh, I, as an engineer, panic a little bit whenever I see those hacks in because I'm like, those are going to be there in 10 years and somebody's going to pull that out and production is going to go down. So this is one we're trying to get ahead of the problem. Uh, and there's so much stuff we could do here, but uh, this is more of a speculative, but it, the big one is airflow. What do I have to do to get you to share nicely with everyone else? Um, and I'd love to have that discussion in detail. And finally, this is the actual cool one. So uh, I'll, I'll end here because I could probably talk for three more days, but everything we do in ML is basically taking huge quantities of data, moving it, doing a really simple translation, wasting a whole bunch of time and effort, and then moving it someplace else. So there's a bunch of layers of abstraction, and in the biggest jobs, this is already a problem. You really can't afford to have a couple of layers of, of oh, we copied it here, and then we copied it here. You really need to, to get it all the way. And as things get bigger, you might not even be able to fit two copies of something into a GPU or on a local disk. Um, you know, some of these data sets, some of the models, um, they're getting pretty good. Uh, GPU models, um, you know, I've seen GPU models and container images that are 40 gigabytes. And they load those directly into the GPU. And 40 gigabytes turns out a lot of uh, container orchestrators and container systems don't pull those very fast. So people want to go optimize this. So that's just one example. but. We're just basically moving all this data around. So there's a couple of pieces um, that I was hoping to, to think about. So those big training jobs, thousands of GPUs over months, those are really expensive. Um, you know, you've seen some estimates. Somebody said something like it'll cost a billion dollars to train the generation after the current one being trained. It's months and months and months of these very scarce, expensive GPUs. So obviously failing halfway through, on an error that could have been avoidable is going to get somebody fired. Or at the very least, you're going to feel very sad explaining to your board why you just burned $500 million of GPU time. So there's this concept called checkpointing, which is you run a batch job um, to train your models. And you do epics. So like every, I don't know, 20 minutes, you say, hey, we've done some training. Save the current state just in case something bad happens. And the more of that you have, the more data you're trying to save. And it's a really cool problem. Like you can generate terabytes and terabytes and terabytes of snapshots that you want to use until the next epic finishes and you want to throw it away. That sounds a little bit like backing up a container, which we've never really well solved, right? Like if you're a platform team out there, there's a lot of different solutions for backing up workloads in containers. They're all kind of eh. And so for me, I look at these two problems and think, wow, wouldn't it be nice if when we go really solve this problem for like, there's $500 million on the line, we're going to go solve it. What if we could get a benefit at the same time? What if it was really easy to checkpoint or to back up the state of a running container? Would that be useful for airflow? Would that be useful, for instance, if at the end of a task, you could really easily dump that for analysis later. And instead of the operations team having to go build a whole system to track those backups and not let them build up and then they crash your storage system or blow up your account, whatever it is, um, what if this was just baked in? 
And what if you could say like, oh, I'm going to start a pod. I need um, some temporary storage that lasts for 15 minutes. And then the next time something runs, um, I'm going to throw it away. Like today you ask for, like when you, when you use Kubernetes and ask for disks, the way it works is you just ask for something kind of dumb. You're like, I need 100 gigabytes. I don't know. What are you going to use it for? I don't know. And the platform teams, you know, they get a bunch of requests. They go set up and they pick two or three types. And the end result is that, you know, you lose a lot of data. We can't go do smart things with that 100 gigabyte disk. But if you told us that you wanted to use it as a cache and that you needed probably up to about 50 gigs and it would stay around for 20 minutes after your pod terminated, we could go do some more interesting things. And so a lot of, uh, you know, as, as I do my own, like, you know, hacking and data analysis, I generate a lot of temporary snapshots. Um, there's a lot of similar problems from training to experimentation to data munging to just like testing out and debugging why something didn't work in production. The idea of making it easier to kind of snapshot what's going on feels really appealing to me. Is there something that we could do together? And it's not going to just be Kubernetes. It'll be you know, the cloud providers. It'll be the storage providers. But this is an opportunity we really haven't seized. Uh, and finally, uh, and so like, you, know, you can imagine as well, could we make it easier? Something we really haven't done is could we make it easier to have temporary storage that's shared across a group of pods, like, I don't know, an Airflow workflow, um, where as a platform team, you define the rules, we can pull it out, but we could actually tune much more closely to what you need, which isn't a really, really stable 100 gigabyte persistent disk, or make a human go figure that out, but we could make the machines do it, because that's kind of what they're there for. So overall, data, very underexplored. Um, but I think for the last 10 years, the one thing I've noticed is we did a bunch of stuff early on, and we said, awesome. Go get them, Tiger. And everybody else went out and built a bunch of stuff. And now, 10 years later, I think it's legitimately time for us to ask, what can we do at this really low layer of the stack? How do we talk to the right people in the right communities and build consensus as this problem looms on the horizon of these mountains of data and compute? I just want to make some people's lives easier. I recognize that Kubernetes has flaws. I apologize in advance. Or after the case, uh, as some of you have. And how do we productively go forward with those flaws? So uh, thank you for the time. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk here. And it was a privilege. And I hope that you will reach out to me, um, you know, Smarter Clayton uh, on, Git, on GitHub and X. You can open issues to me in Kubernetes and assign them and say, hey, I've got a really great idea. Um, let's talk. Uh, you can reach out to Rafal um, you know, uh, if, you, if you have a connection to him. Um, and I'm always, uh, I'm always on the Kubernetes Slack. Maybe I should join the Airflow Slack, and then you guys can find me. But I would, I would love to actually have a productive dialogue about how we, at the plumbing level, give you some more options um, in the next few years with LLM. Thank you very much.